This is Real Estate Rookie episode 411. What would you find out if you rehabbed your childhood home? My name is Ashley Kerr, and I'm here with Tony J. Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, three times a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. We are here today with Tyler Cameron, a seasoned investor and TV personality that is sharing his projects and all the fun that goes into construction. Now, today we'll get into the 411 of Tyler's short-term rentals and hear some of the mistakes he's made and how that has helped him improve his project. So we're excited to hear what you've learned while getting your hands dirty. So Tyler, welcome to the show, brother. Man, I appreciate y'all having me. I definitely will put the rookie and rookie for y'all. So I'm excited to get down with this and uh, big fan of the show, big fan of Bigger Pockets and everything that you guys have been able to create and do. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, excited to talk what I got into now. Well, Tyler, I'm really curious as to what your childhood home has to do with real estate investing for you. Yeah, no, it's uh, so here's here's a long story that I'll try and make short. My childhood home this is the first home my parents ever brought me into. Um, and uh, 31 years of living at home, we put a lot of wear and tear on that house. Um, when my mom lived there, it was a home. And then when she passed away, uh, it became a frat house. And uh, we just kind of let it deteriorate. Um, but we uh, we wanted to to renovate it and, and honor my mom the way, you know, that she would have wanted the house done. Uh, we had a lot of our old plans and ideas that we were able to to make the house with. And uh, the reason why it is a, you know, a rental property now is, is I was living in it for a little bit, but then I kind of felt guilty living there. I'm like, well, this is me and my brother's house now. I, I can make something out of this and I can go find myself the next project for myself. And uh, I turned it to a short term rental. And um, and now it's kind of like that gift that keeps on giving, you know, like it's my, the light that keeps shining. My mom keeps looking out for us. Uh, it's creating great profit for me and my brothers. And hopefully that'll turn into the next real estate project for me and my brothers to share. Yeah. Well, Tyler, I'm super happy you guys were, were able to kind of honor your mom by, by taking this project down, brother. So, so kudos to you guys. Now, I, I know every every rehab project uh, isn't without its surprises. So I guess I'm curious, like, did you find anything unexpected during the, the renovation project here? This, this is a new term I learned. Is it what? NSFW? Not, not safe for work. <laughs> so this might be one of those comments, guys, but uh, why not? You know, why not throw my little brothers under the bus? So um, my little brother, uh, Ryan, was just the biggest punk in high school. And uh, and so as we're renovating the home, we were like ripping out one of these walls. And uh, it's the wall between his room and the living room. And when we opened it up, we found a bunch of used condoms and vape pens in the wall. And we're like, and, and like, I'm dumbfounded by it. I'm like, who the heck would, you know, put those in there? Like, like, first of all, why is there a hole in the wall? Second of all, why are you not going to the trash can and throwing it away? Wait, to recap, this is your childhood home still, correct? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and whose bedroom was this? <laughs> so, so. Because we found vape pens in there, we were able to claim we were able to prove that it was my youngest brother Ryan, because he used to be a vape pen dealer in high school, so it couldn't be anyone else. <laughs> Wait, I, I gotta ask uh, Tyler, did you guys ever get to the bottom of why he was storing them inside the walls? Like, what was the reason behind that? Because guys are disgusting, <laughs> you know, and guys would rather just go into the wall, I guess, and throw away the used condom or throw away the vape pen than walking. 10 more feet and going to the bathroom or going to the garbage can. Oh my God. My poor mother, my poor mother. <laughs> she had to deal with not only you know me and my three brothers, but my dad too. And in, in, in that little house. So I don't know what's worse is going into a house you just bought and finding a stranger's condoms or going into a home and knowing that it's your brother's condoms. I'm not really sure which is worse in that situation. <laughs> I think it's my. I think it's worse when it's your brothers because you're like shame on you. Like, you could have done so much better than that. You know, like the, the 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 strangers you don't really know anything about, so they could be whatever. You know, but I'm like my brother. I'm like, how low life are you, man? You can't just go throw it out in the trash can. So, I, Tyler, we're off to a great start here with <laughs> definitely an interesting story. But overall, today, what does your portfolio look like? 
All right, so I'm I'm learning, guys. I'm definitely like I'm putting the rookie in in rookie in investing right now. Um, so I have two properties that are short term rentals. Um, I have uh one long term rental property that I just acquired that I renovated and now I got to get on the market, but it's in Jacksonville. And then I have another house in Jacksonville that we're flipping. Uh, I have a house that's a spec home that we did for sale in uh in Jupiter, and then. I'm in the process of possibly purchasing two lots right now to build two more short-term rentals in in my town of Jupiter. Tyler, I just want to say, man, like you 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 put this big disclaimer, like I'm I'm a rookie, I'm a rookie, and then you said I got two long-term rentals, one short-term, a flip, a spec home, two lots. It's like you're you're doing a lot, man. And I I want to call that out because I, I think for for a lot of new investors. Sometimes we discount the hard work that we've done to get to where we are. But I'll tell you, like the the difference between the person who's at zero deals and the person who's at one is way bigger than the person who's at one and the person who's at five. It's intimidating. It's scary. It's and, it, and it's to go from zero to one is is massive. It's it's a big step. Uh, one to two is a lot easier than zero to one. Uh, but I think for me the hardest part is so. A little bit more background. Uh, my dad's a builder, right? And he was trying to become a developer. Um, he was doing really, really well uh, before the uh, before the 08 crash. And my dad went from being worth probably five million at the time to losing it all, to to having nothing. And literally, that's how we ended up back in my childhood home because we lived on a, a better house on the water on the same street. We all had to go back to the little house that we, you know we owned. Um, so my father, my person I looked to for advice, became very conservative, very trigger shy. And so I learned, you know, really, you know, right before the pandemic, there was a, a house, a, a lot for sale on the water in my street. And it was a lot for $625,000, I remember. And I could have bought it, but it would have been all my marbles. And I'm also like, well, what's this pandemic? Like, am I going to make any money during the pandemic? Like, I'm not in showbiz anymore. Like, how's this money going to come in? Because the whole world's stopping. So I didn't do it. Uh, someone else bought it, built a big two-story house. It's now worth $3.5 million. I'm like, damn, I missed. And so then I became quick draw McGraw and just started firing at everything I saw. And uh, which so far has been pretty good to me. Like, I started buying some land. We turned it into spec homes and the land has doubled, you know, from places I bought it, you know, three years later. So, so far it's been good. Um, but the biggest lesson was like not pulling the trigger and letting someone sway you from pulling it because of their own past. And uh, that was probably my biggest lesson. And and I'm sure I'll take a lesson soon when I should have bought some, you know. Tyler, how long ago was it that you actually made or did the first property? And then what is your portfolio valued at today in that time frame? Oh, man, uh, I, I haven't really thought about those numbers. Let, let's see. Um, so the first the first property I bought and built on um, was probably in 2021. I bought a piece of land for 175. We probably put nine hundred thousand into the build, and we sold it for one point four five. And then we did a, we did we're doing a, we did another house, the same house, um, but we priced it higher because the market's still higher. And right now we're kind of sitting on it, so we're probably going to keep coming down in price here. Um, but portfolio wise, um, I have let's say probably around like three million dollars worth of real estate. That's amazing! In what three years? Yeah. 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 That's awesome. So it's, it's been, it's been good. I've, it's been, I've been very lucky in a sense that, um, I've been able to take the money I've made from show business and I literally just funnel that right into real estate. Um, I, and, and now what I've learned too is I can do real estate content that helps build my portfolio and people love it. Yeah. And it's creating content for. The show business too. Exactly. So, so now it's all like kind of working together, which is great. So it's a lot easier to do. Tyler, how do you manage being a public figure and you see this online versus reality? How does that differ? Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough. You know, it definitely takes some growing up and, and, and taking your lumps and, and building up thicker skin. Um, luckily for me, I was a really bad quarterback in high school and college. So I, got, I grew thick skin by throwing a lot of interceptions. Um, 
so I was able to kind of adjust more now in the light, but it definitely, you got to learn how to take your phone, put it away. You know, you, you're going to have 90% of your comments are always going to be good comments. 10% are always going to be someone trying to bash you. And why would you give the 10% the energy, you know? Um, so it's, it's things that I've learned throughout the way, but, uh, online and reality are definitely two different stories. Um, and so it's, it's definitely, you got to find a way to balance it. So you're not usually walking around shirtless, dancing on a truck, swinging a hammer. <laughs> oh no, I'm definitely walking around shirtless and dancing around. That is some reality to it. <laughs> if you're going to be working, you better make it fun. You know, I, my, my neighbors get, my neighbors get a show, I guess. <laughs> And the one thing I always saw, you know, on the Internet is everyone wants to be so perfect, you know, and everyone wants to be 100 percent correct. And then there's also people who are, are commenting, too, like when you're posting stuff about construction and whatnot, that they want to rip you apart. You know, you don't know how to do this. You're doing this wrong, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think an approach I've taken has also helped me is I am no know it all. I don't know what I'm doing half the time, but I'm learning. I've been learning every day. Since for the last two years, since I've been, you know, really dedicated to this industry and this business. And I have my GC license, but I wasn't building all the time. I, I, you know, the GC license just says I know how to pass a test. It's not really knowing to how to build a house. Uh, so, you know, I've been able to kind of invite the commenters and invite the people who, uh, you know, give me the harsh responses because I want to learn. I, I, I have no problem you know, being the village idiot sometimes and not knowing what's going on. You know, I, I appreciate you sharing that, Tyler, because I, again, for a lot of new investors, we have that fear of asking the question for fear of looking dumb. And a, a mentor told me this, I think it actually might've been one of my teachers when I was younger, but it, it just always stuck with me. And he was like, Tony, you can either, uh, you know, <laughs> you can either be fearful of looking dumb by asking the question, or you can actually be dumb by not asking the question. And it's like, what, what's more important to you, you know? So I've, I've always kind of taken that with me. And like, I'm, I'm the first guy to raise my hand and say, I don't know what that means. And there's been a lot of times, even on this show, you know, like a stopple agreement, Ash, and I always laugh about that. But there's, there's things that I learn as the host where I'm like, man, I've never heard that before. So I think having the humility to admit when you don't know something is what allows you to really keep that growth and, and take it to the next level. Yeah, because I mean, for sure. And you don't want to learn the hard way because the hard way is usually painful or expensive. You know, and, and uh, if you if you're humble enough to ask the questions, you know, and, and go through it that way, you can save yourself a lot of pain and money and, and issues going forward. I think, too, also being able to receive the constructive criticism, like if I, I've been in the same position where I posted something and someone's called it out, like it probably shouldn't have been done that way you know, it should have been done this way or that's wrong or whatever. And being able to say, you know what? Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to inform me of this instead of like trying to defend yourself and feeling attacked, like being able to be perceptive as to taking other people's constructive criticism that are genuinely trying to help you, even though it may seem there are some people that are like just trying to call you out and prove you wrong, but just kill them with kindness. Exactly. Exactly. I, I, I've i noticed that it's like usually the, the men in the industry who are like on the like commenting the craziest stuff, but the women so nice on in the industry. They're, they're the best. Tyler, you mentioned like, uh, you know, not asking those questions can lead to, you know, more time, more pain, more mistakes, really. And, you know, even if we ask the right questions, a lot of times becoming a real estate investor, you do find yourself making some mistakes along the way. So I guess maybe maybe share some of the mistakes you've made so far in your journey. And what are some of the lessons you've learned from that? Yeah, I think definitely like the, the biggest mistake I'm experiencing right now and something that I'm learning is that uh Pre-planning is so important, like really going through that house, living in it maybe for a little bit and really figuring out what you're going to do before just kind of shooting from the hip as you go. And luckily, I've been able to, to piece things together pretty good right now. Like I'm renovating my house right now. And then we did my short term rental on the TV show I just came out with. And like a lot of stuff, we were just kind of shooting as we go. But when you don't have a plan, it's so easy to add on something else. You know, it's so easy to just blow past that budget because you're not thinking about all the things that could have happened and then you start ripping it away. And I don't know. I just learned that when I walk into a project and we have the whole blueprint, the whole, you know, list of bullets that we want to knock out and achieve in this project, 
it goes so much smoother. It goes closer to budget, you know, or even under budget where if you're just kind of ripping and going and just figuring out along the way, it gets it gets expensive because you start piecemealing everything. We interviewed our good friend, James Daynard, who's also the host of the, the uh, Bigger Pockets on the Market podcast. And it was episode 387. We've had James on a few times, but episode 387 specifically, he talked about his like process for creating his scope of work. And he's got a really, really involved like process that he walks through where he's actually getting his realtors involved at the beginning of his flips to say, hey, what kind of flooring should I be choosing? What finishes should I be adding here? What do you think about this floor plan? That way, before he even closes on the deal, he's got someone who knows what the property will resell for that's giving him that input. Oh, for sure. Because I mean, for instance, another mistake, like the short term rental we did on the show, the designers we went over budget by a lot and we gold plated that house. I'll probably never make what I put into that house if I were to sell it. Now, because I'm short term renting it, I'm probably going to be able to recoup it in some years. But because we gold plated it, it'll never sell for the value that we put, you know, that, that we could have put in a nicer home, essentially. So, I mean, that's that's important. So you got to know what type of material you're going to put in. Are you going to do LVT? Are you going to do you know, engineer hardwood, or you're going to, you know, tile, porcelain tile, like, what are you going to do? Um, so that's definitely an important step, knowing the price points that you're going to try and hit when you try to sell or try to flip it. Do you think that's also one of the lessons you have learned as far as how much you're spending on the project? Another big lesson I've learned too, is uh, you get what you pay for in this industry. Um, like I had a project manager that I was, that I hired and it was kind of when I was running this show, I just needed more bodies. I needed people to kind of run material and do all these things. And he wasn't really on all the subs like he should have been. And now I'm going back sometimes and fixing things two or three times because of him. And, and that's when you start really losing money too, is you got to keep coming back, keep making fixes on the punch outs and all that. Um, and then you also got to realize too, like certain subs are for certain price points when renovating or when building a house, um, when you have a higher end finish, you got to go pay the pay the pretty dollar to go get the the right guys to do the high end finishes. If you got a guy who's a sloppy tile guy in a, in a multi million dollar house, that's not going to look good for you. That's not going to help you sell. Uh, so those are some big lessons I've learned, um, and and also like some issues I've had been working with my dad is we're I'm trying to do some higher end stuff. And he's sold more like the four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar price point range, and I'm trying to sell him to one point five one point seven million dollar price point range, those are different finishers, you know? And uh and you know, I, I've had to point things out and show and you know, my dad's been in this game for thirty years and he always tells me I've forgotten more than you know. And I'm like, well thanks, you know, but I can tell you when a line is you know, when 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 the tile lines are not looking good, you know, like um so that's that's definitely something I also learned. Um I spoke earlier about like not pulling the trigger and letting people talk you out of things. If, if you, you, you got to trust your gut, you got to trust your numbers. Um, and everyone's going to talk you out of things because they all want you to be safe, you know, especially your family. They're, they all want you to protect you. And, you know, if it was up to my dad, I would just put my money away and never spend it ever again. But I, I can't live life that way. I want to go learn. I want to grow. I want to keep building and improving myself. Let me, I just want to, I want to ask one follow-up question on that because I think the, the not pulling the trigger when maybe the people in your circle are, are not as supportive as you want them to be, that's like a universal problem for people looking to get started in real estate. So how, how are you finding the courage? Like you said, your dad has decades of experience in this space. So he, he probably does have uh, a little bit of an idea of what works and what doesn't. How are you finding the courage to still move forward at the pace with the goals that you have for yourself? I think if you truly believe in something and you can see, I think you got to do the research one. You know what I mean? And you got to find, you know, numbers and things that back you up. Like you don't want to just go into something not knowing it, pulling the trigger. That's how you get yourself into a big issue. But, um, you know, research is important. But also, just I feel like with my father, you know, He's just, he's gotten burned. So his whole thing is, is I don't want you to get burned, you know, but if I do get burned, I'm young enough to know that I will recoup my money. I will find another way to make it and I will learn from it. And I think, you know, right now I'm 31. The best thing I have on my side is time and I can, I can make mistakes right now and I can learn, I can go. Um, but if you keep listening to someone and everyone's talking to you away from doing something, uh, I, 
I, I'm a firm believer. You just got to go for it. People have talked me out of trying to do the bachelorette. I went and did it. It was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, if you have that gut and the intuition that you can go make it happen and it's something that you truly want to do, you're going to find a way to make it work, you know? And, uh, to me, it's just been something that I've had to deal with with my father and, uh, it's been tough cause we definitely disagree. But then once I start proving a concept to him, then he wants to hop on board. I'm like, ha, I told you, I got you. But, um, <laughs> you just gotta, you just gotta really, uh, like believe in what you want to do. Um, and, and, and don't let people get in, you know, get in your head. If, if you have done the research, you believe in yourself, anything's possible. Like, I look at people that I want to be and I see them pulling the triggers on everything. I'm like, if I don't, if you don't get in the game, you're never going to be in the game, you know? So I just, you just got to dive in and go for it. I, I love that you prefaced it though, Tyler, with like educating yourself, because I, I do think that's an important foundation to lay, but there's also the flip side of that where people can sometimes over educate. And what I, what I like to share with rookies is that if you get to the point where you're listening to the podcast, you're watching the YouTube videos, you're reading the books, and a lot of the information starts to sound familiar, it's things you've already heard before, that's probably the sign that it's time for you to, to, to take action and stop with the, the consumption and move over, move over to action. And honestly, the, the, you can read and you can do all these things, but the best way to learn is to get in that fire. Is to get in there, start ripping walls out, start really putting it together, starting to see what it costs, to see, you know, to get bids from people, to have to see what a good drywall guy is, to see what a bad drywall guy is. You got to get in the fire to learn all these things and start building out your team. And if you just, you know, I would say my dad's got the worst case of it, analysis of paralysis or paralysis of analysis, whichever way it is, you know. Uh, but like that has always kind of slowed him down from making things happen and, and, and being, you know, and just. And, and then, then the moment will come and come and leave you. Okay, Tyler, we've gone over a couple or several mistakes and lessons that you've learned. What about on the operations side for your short-term rentals? Is there any lessons that you have learned there? Definitely. Uh, I, I'm in the short-term rental business. I also have a few restaurants. And what I've learned from there is the customer is always right. And like short-term rental, you're like, God, it's like you're, you're going back and forth on the messages with them on host away. And, you're like, God, this person is such a pain in my ass. But then you're like, you know what? Just go do it. Go get it done. And then you meet them in person. They're very, very nice. They just don't know how to come across in a message. A lot of times like an older lady or older couple who doesn't know how to text, you know? And, uh, like, and like in the beginning of my short term rentals, uh, you know, they're like, Oh, I need beach chairs. Oh, I need a baby crib. Oh, I need this. I need that. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to say yes and get these people everything because eventually I'll have enough stuff that I'll never have to get anything anymore. And uh, I think when you do a short term rental, you usually can get a little bit of enough spread to where a hundred bucks here or 200 bucks there to get something to make someone's, you know, experience better and, and, and happier is huge. You know, I, I pride ourselves. Like I think we've had all but one five star review so far on both properties. And I think that's because we're trying to over deliver to our customers. We want to make sure they have everything they have. And if they need something, we go get it. Tony, I want to ask if you have that, you share that same opinion because I've seen the Instagram reel of somebody trying to say that they slipped and fell on the property and it was actually, you know, them drinking wine out back. And <laughs> fell. So what is your opinion on uh, Tyler's statement there that the customer is always right? Yeah, we, we definitely believe that giving a, a small refund is better than like a terrible review because, you know, over the long run, the, the bad reviews stack up. Uh, but we also at times want to, you know, depending on what the guest is saying, kind of verify. So like what, what Ashley was referencing, we had a guest one time, Tyler, who said they slipped and fell uh, in our backyard. And, you know, that's a that's a big concern. And like, you know, my, my back's hurting me, this, that and the other. And we end up pulling up the camera footage from the backyard. Like we have cameras back there and she had been drinking. And she went to go sit down in her seat and she just missed the seat. So imagine if we would have just said, yeah, the, the customer is always right. Now we're, we're potentially open ourselves up to litigation or liability. So we always want to make sure that if there's proof uh, that we lean back on that proof first. Tony, do you have cameras in your backyards at all your places? Uh, all the ones that have like big enough backyards. Yeah. So majority we have exterior cameras at the front and the back. And that, cause that's something I'm always like, uh, is that invading on the customer? But I guess it protects you in the end. 1000%. We've had some guests, you know, you know, we've had a lot of guests at our properties over the years. We've had some guests that have said like, 
hey, we don't like the cameras back there. And we say, hey, look, this this is for your safety and for ours. Uh, it, you know, it's not pointing anywhere that's invite, invading your privacy. Just know we're, we're only going to reference it if there's an issue. Uh, but yeah, we, we like to put cameras, uh, you know, on all the exteriors of our properties. Okay. That's something I might have to add. Yeah, because Tony constantly yells at me because I have one property where they actually have the option to turn it off. So there's a switch activated to it. So it's on, the cleaner turns it on. So when they check in, we can see the camera and then we have them turn it back on when they leave. So it's only on when nobody's there and then they can turn it off if they want. But I'll have to get that rewired sometimes so they can't do that because <laughs> Tony keeps hounding me. <laughs> No, no. I mean, it's smart. It makes sense. And like like you said, it protects you legally too, in a sense. So yeah, you don't want those issues. Let's talk about um, more about your portfolio and some of the missed opportunities that you have had throughout your time investing. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, you know, the, the misses I spoke about earlier was like, you know, not investing in that one property on the water. Uh, I've had a, a mentor of mine who, you know, his thing is, you can't buy more water. Like the, what's there is there, you know? So if you ever get a chance to get your piece, get your piece. And I missed my opportunity. Tyler, I, I have to say, I'm so happy you said that because just this morning I got under contract a lake property and I've been like so nervous because this is like a leap for me, but you know, solidifying that there's right. There's no more water. It's going to be okay. <laughs> yeah. It, I mean, there, it, there isn't, there's nowhere to go with it. So I missed my piece and I, I drive by every day now and I just kick myself in the ass and, you know, I'm like, well, don't do that, kid, you idiot, you know. But sometimes the, the, the scariest risk are like the, the biggest lessons in them. And then they become the most exciting things, you know, like you know, opportunities. Tony and I were just talking about that. Uh, we do this episode where it's like a horror episode where somebody comes on and tells like something that went really bad, whether it was a tenant or property damage, whatever. But most of them, pretty much all of them, have like it ended up being okay in the long run like the property ended up appreciating or there ended up being cash flow after they got through that like hump that that wall they overcame it it ended up being fine except for my property in shreveport every other property we've talked about for story wise <laughs> had a good ending out of i had a property a long-term rental and there was there was no there was no happy ending to that it was just a bad ending altogether we lost a lot of money on that one but even there you still learn something from it right exactly i think you can look back on it 10 years like oh, see that taught me something at least you know Sometimes like education expensive. This waterfront property, was this in Jupiter, Florida then where you're from? And maybe tell us a little bit about that market. Yeah, yeah. So so my market, Jupiter, Florida, um, it's an exploding market because uh, COVID was a huge part of it. But now, uh, I mean, so many people from New York, from LA, a lot of snowbirds, uh, mainly Connecticut, all that, New York, Jersey, they all come down and buy. They were all buying their second homes down here. Now a lot of them are just living down here. Um, it's the tax benefits. It's all the good things. Jupiter is a luxurious boat town, golf town. Um, it used to be a little blue collar town and now it has really become kind of like the, a very, very wealthy place for people to live to experience the water. We have the best waterways. Um, besides, I think it's Miami and us when it comes to waterways. Uh, you know, the, the market has, you know, when I was buying houses for, you know, $500,000, now they're $650,000. Um, it's just gotten more expensive. It's, it's painful to see, you know, I'm like, oh man, how am I going to get this next one and have a spread, you know? Um, but you know, we, uh, we've been lucky to like, we, we've bought a couple pieces of property in the back, back in the day, probably three or four years ago that have appreciated and we're going to build, uh, build houses on those and turn them into rentals. But it, it, it's a tough market now. You know, it's very competitive. Um, there was a house on my street. I don't know how this happened, guys. You might have to tell me. But there was a house on my street. Um, I was going to turn it to a short-term rental. It was a complete gut. It could be a teardown if someone wanted to do that. Uh, I bid, I started my first bid at 430. And then I ended up bidding 530 because it got crazy. Apparently, I was the highest bidder because it sold for 515. I'm like, how did this person get it for 515 and I bid 530? So that was frustrating. Was it an all cash offer? It could have been. I was I was going to be all cash too, but I, I just, I don't know. I don't know how that happened. Um, 
but it, it is a, like anytime there's like a property that's distressed and, and like at a lower price point, it just gets bid up like crazy. But you know what? Maybe something happened where they did bid more than you and then they negotiated once it was under contract, like they found something wrong or whatever and then renegotiated. There was this house I looked at that sold for $200,000 less than what it had been listed at. And we had put an offer on it. A lot of people put offers in and it ended up there must have been some big, huge issue with it or whatever. And I I think it was because you didn't actually own the land. You were just buying the property and then leasing the land and nobody really knew that. And then that was all found out during the, you know, doing the title work and stuff. But it could have been something like that. Tyler, one thing that jumps out to me is you're you're talking a lot about the the build process and it's it's slightly different building than rehabbing. I guess what are maybe some of the the benefits you're seeing of doing the the ground up builds versus rehabbing properties? Yeah, so I think when you do a rehab, it's like an onion. We always compare it to an onion. Every time you peel back a layer, you find something else. And then you peel back another layer and you find something else. And uh, when you do new construction, you literally know where every wire is going, where all the walls are going, what, what pipes are on white, what, what walls and whatnot. And I also think, too, you get the biggest return on new builds. You know, when you are when when you go to refinance it, like, for instance, we're going to, to build this house in Tequesta, which is like a village in Jupiter. And when we build this house, um, we're, we bought the land for like 225. Uh, it's probably around 350, 400 now with appreciation since we bought it. Um, we're going to put probably 700 into it. And then so now we're, you know, probably at like a million, you know, we're talking about equity wise. And then, uh, I mean, it'll probably be more than that once we're all said and done with the value of the house. And we'll be able to refinance that, pull a bunch of money out, probably make money on what we pulled out, hopefully. And then turn that to the next project. But I just feel like you get more money if you're trying to stay to do like the burn method or whatever. Um, you're going to get more money with a new build, I feel like, than you would with a renovation. Tyler, what's the what's the typical time frame on a on a new build? Like we just renovated a 13 unit uh, motel outside of Zion in Utah, and our team 13 13 weeks from start to finish, they were they were done. Tony, you did a you did a, you did a motel in Zion. We, we did, man. It's on the, it's on the other side of Zion. So it's not as busy as like the Springdale side, but yeah, it's uh, it's about 30 minutes outside of Zion. That's so cool. I mean, one, I love Zion too. Like I would, I would love to do like a boutique motel one day. Like that's sick. That's very cool. I mean, a new build, you're probably looking at like five to six months with my dad. It could be a year, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it should be in the six month range. So let's talk about your TV show a little bit here and tell us more about how this, the, how this came about. Yeah. Um, well, it's been a long process. Uh, the show is called going home with Tyler Cameron. It's right now it's out on prime video. You can binge all eight episodes. Um, it's, it's been a process to make this show happen. Um, we were, we were trying to start, we were trying to film the sizzle reel back in February, 2020, right before the, uh, right before COVID happened. Um, we had some unfortunate things happen and we had COVID happen. So it pushed back everything and pushed back the show. So four years later, we finally got this show. Um, it's finally out. Um, it's, it's my baby. It's cool. It's, and it's kind of like a lot like what we're talking about here. You guys see me grow from episode one to episode eight. You see me make mistakes. You see me learn from them. You see me get better at it. I told production, I was like, guys, we're starting a construction company from ground zero. I want people to know it's starting from ground zero and learn and be a part of the growth with us. And uh, it's been an awesome response. Uh, people, you know, they're like, oh, we learned so much. I love how, like, you're able to share your mistakes and whatnot. Um, and it's actually been a very emotional show for people. Like, a lot of people have hit me back. Like, we've cried. I, I didn't think I was going to cry in so many episodes. So uh, it's been it's been a great response. It's been an amazing show. And uh, But home rental shows. People in that industry who do that, it's the hardest thing ever. Because, I mean, if you think about it, you guys, are, we have a construction team. We have a design team. We have a production team. We have the clients. We have the town that we have to work with. To, so to try and maneuver all those people and plan, it's a nightmare. It's hard enough just to schedule contractors, let alone a production crew. Uh, and like, and then you're you're kind of paying a little bit more for your contractors than usually, because like, you're like, guys, I need you to focus on these projects and help me get through this, you know. And and even then, it's still a fight. 
Tyler, what are some of the things that maybe a viewer can learn from watching your show besides just seeing your transformation? What are some of the takeaways that they can benefit by watching? Yeah, I think you, you know, you, you see some of the mistakes I make, like simple construction mistakes. Turn off the damn water main. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> know where the shut off switch is. <laughs> yeah, know where it is. Yeah. I mean, I did that in a condo and, and didn't turn and couldn't find it. And so I'm like holding this bucket, you know, as it keeps overflowing and like finding another bucket. Like it was so bad. And then we had to call someone. They took their sweet time to get up there. And of course, it was like hidden in the back behind the AC unit. It was just a nightmare. Um, so I broke like three water mains on the show. Uh, yeah, yeah. And another big thing, you know, we had to learn was like how to meet these timelines. And these timelines aren't like your typical, oh, you can push it another week in, in like real world construction or two weeks and then it becomes a month or whatever. But when you are doing a TV show, every time you're delaying, you're, you're, you're paying for, you know, the whole production team. You're paying for all these people that can't do anything, can't film anything. Uh, so you, I mean, it ended up being like 4 a.m. nights, 5 a.m. nights just to try and get these houses done on time to get these people in their homes so we could shoot it. And, and it was just a beast. So, I mean, the major lessons is like, you know, just time management, you know, organizing, knowing how to delegate. All those things have, have been like big lessons for me. Well, thank you so much, Tyler, for coming on. And I hope everyone takes the opportunity to check out your show on Prime. And it is called Going Home with Tyler Cameron. And if you want to learn more about Tyler, you can go to our show notes on your favorite podcast platform or in the description in YouTube. Awesome. I appreciate you guys. Y'all have a good one. I'm Ashley and he's Tony. Thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll see you on the next episode. Still, yeah.